Good day, ENG2D. We're going to continue on today with our study of Act 4 Macbeth. We'll start today by taking a look at the questions for Act 4. Now, taking a look at the questions is actually a strategy that you're going to want to try to remember when you are writing the literacy test. Not sure if that'll happen this year or not, um, but at some point you will likely have to do that. If you take the time to read the questions beforehand, then it is um, it is a time-saving strategy in that you will then have um, uh, prior knowledge about what to look for as we continue through the actual play. So let's take a look here. Act 4, scene 1. Question number 1. What does each of the apparitions represent? Now an apparition again is a ghost, right? Uh, number 2. What effect do the three prophecies have upon Macbeth? And I'm going to give you a little hint. Uh, it has to do with how those prophecies make him feel, particularly about Macduff. Number three, what does Macbeth decide to do about Macduff? What does this tell us of his character at this point in the play? So the hint here is emotionally. What has changed in Macbeth emotionally, particularly from the beginning of the play? What is he now able to do quite easily that he wasn't easy? That wasn't easy before. Uh, number four, give at least two examples of how Shakespeare uses sound, rhythm, or song, and details like imagery to create the atmosphere of horror in this scene. So just one example for each or one quote for each is good enough. Act four, scene two. Number one, of what does Lady Macbeth accuse her husband? Sorry, not Lady Macbeth, Lady Macduff accuse her husband of how uh, regarding how he feels about her and um, the children that they have together. Number two, how is this third great crime different from and similar to Macbeth's previous two? Is it his worst crime? So again, you're going to listen really closely to my interpretation here um, because most of these questions are going to be specifically addressed in the um, uh, in the video. Number three, only Macduff's son is murdered on, murdered on stage. Why? Would you have his wife and servants murdered on stage as well? And then again, some hints are going to um, happen as we proceed through the play. Act four, scene three. Outline the comment, sorry, outline and comment on Macduff's, ugh, Malcolm's definition of a good king. And I've given you a, a big hint there. Right, so Act 4, Scene 3, line 104 to 106, where he lists characteristics of virtues appropriate for a king. Number two, illustrate a comparison between Macduff and Macbeth's characters. So we know that these two are going to be, well, you're going to find out that they are arch nemesis. No, arch nemesis. Um, so Macduff is going to announce that he is going to be the nemesis of Macbeth. But beyond that, how do they compare and contrast? And again, lots of hints are going to be given as you proceed. Uh, number three, why does Malcolm distrust Macduff at the beginning of the scene? And then finally, number four, what finally convinces Malcolm that Macduff is truly trustworthy and loyal? Okay, so let's get right into the actual play. Now, the uh, if you have this version of the uh, of the play, uh, this gives us a really good um, so, um, ability to picture what's happening here. So we have the three witches. Macbeth has already announced, has told his wife uh, that he plans on going back to see the witches. So let's um, let's get started here. Let's... Okay, so in this scene, sorry, act four, scene one. In this scene, the witches chant and dance around a bubbling cauldron, brewing a spell. Macbeth enters their cave, demanding that they answer his questions. In fact, he would prefer that the whole universe be turned to chaos rather than he be denied what he wants to know. So this again shows us a lot about how his character has evolved. He is selfish, 
certainly a bastard. Um, but more so, more specifically, he's showing characteristics of being very Machiavellian. If you haven't watched the video on Machiavelli, Niccolo Machiavelli, please make sure you go back and watch that video on the Edsby, um, on the Edsby wall. On the final uh, unit test, there will be some questions about Machiavelli, um, both Niccolo Machiavelli and Machiavellian behavior. So yeah, so right here, Macbeth is asking the witches to um, make sure that they answer his questions, and he doesn't care what happens to the whole universe. He says, the whole universe can be, be destroyed for all I care. Just make sure you answer my questions. So again, very Machiavellian, the end justifies the means. This time, the prophecies are spoken by apparitions or ghosts that are conjured by the, uh, the witches, more specifically, um, the queen of the witches. Um, the first apparition is a head wearing a bloody, or sorry, a battle helmet. Number two, the second apparition, is a blood-covered child. And then the third ghost or apparition is a child wearing a crown and carrying a tree. So here are the three apparitions, the three ghosts. They tell Mac Macbeth, then they give three warnings. So these three apparitions give Macbeth three warnings. The first warning, beware Macduff. Number two, he will not be killed by anyone born of woman. And number three, that he will be defeated only when the trees of Burnham Wood move toward his castle. Now, like the first set of prophecies here, we see that the first two are already known. Macbeth already knows he needs to beware, uh, beware of Macduff. And he also knows that he can't be killed by anyone who is not born of woman. So again, they are leading him into confusion by their little half-truths here. As with the earlier prophecies, his knowledge of the first is correct, convinces or sorry, that the first is correct, convinces Macbeth that the next two are also valid. Yeah, he also knows the second one is, is pretty much true. Um, his new sense of security is weakened, however, and it's not just a sense of security. He, when he first hears these um, uh, prophecies, he's going to actually feel invincible, like he is untouchable. Yeah, pretty arrogant, pretty trusting of the witches, absolutely. Um, his new sense of security, though, is weakened, however, when his insistent demand about Banquo's descendants is answered by a parade of ghost kings, apparition kings, each resembling Banquo. As Macbeth curses the witches in rage, they dance and disappear. Lennox answers, sorry, enters the cave to tell Macbeth that messengers have brought news that Macduff has fled, has left Scotland and has gone to the English court to, to England. Furious Macbeth swears to kill Macduff's family. Now what this shows is that this third great crime here, the killing of Macduff's family, shows that he is actually becoming um, emotionally more and more dead, like an emotionally dead monster. The fact that um, it's becoming, killing is becoming easier and easier and easier, right, with very little remorse. So again, just to um, summarize, the three prophecies were head with a helmet, possibly somebody's head getting cut off with a helmet on it, a bloody child, and a child that is wearing a crown, carrying um, a branch. The three warnings that go along with those three prophecies are, beware Macduff, that he can't be killed by anyone born of woman, and that he will not be defeated until Burnham Wood moves to the castle, to his castle at Glam's at Dunsinane. Okay, so again, it's, it's important to also point out that these here are half-truths, right? They're not 100% truth, uh, true, they are just half-true, and by definition, that makes them equivocations. Okay, so let's get right into this again. Here, Act 4, Scene 1. We are in a dark cave in the middle of a cal in the middle, a cauldron is boiling, there is thunder. Enter the three witches. So the three witches here are going to actually be joined by um, by Hecate. 
Hecate is the queen of the witches and she is not happy with the three witches. They've not included her in their fun. And so she's gonna kind of take over a little bit in, um, in helping to really bring Macbeth to his knees. Okay, so the first witch here is going to um, talk about putting a <clears throat> a spell together. And she's gonna put a bunch of, of um, different animals and different, um, um, just different things into a cauldron. And she's gonna boil up uh, all of those items and create a, a spell that goes along with them. Uh, it's called, she calls it a hell broth. So the fact that she calls it a hell broth here means that she is connected with the devil. She's, she's connected to evil. Yeah, so some things she's gonna put in there, a toad, a snake, eye of newt, lizard, uh, toe of frog, wool of bat, tongue of dog, um, a, a lizard's leg, a worm, an owlet, um, so yeah, so she's going to throw in a bunch of things into this, um, into this spell, and then Hecate is going to show up. Christ, the bringing cut of you! Christ, and once the hitch big one! I fear cries, tis time, tis time! Round about the cauldron go! Poison entrails throw, told that on the cold stone, days and nights of thirty-one, sweltering venom, sleeping got, foiled all first in a charmed pot. Double, double, toil, trouble, fire, burn, and pot, burn, bubble. Fear the pretty snake in the cauldron boil and bake. Eye of newt and charm of frog, wool of bat and tongue of dog. Okay, so the first question asks about um, sound and rhythm and detail. A lot of the answers to that question you're gonna get here. There's lots of like um, like sound, repetitive sound, and really good uh, details here, and also lots of imagery. is the queen of all the witches she is not really that impressed that they have left her out but she is pleased she is commending them that um, they're going to so much you know so going going through the details that are that are necessary um, but she's gonna kind of take over here so let's watch how that happens oh well done I commend your pain and everyone shall share in the gains. And now about the cauldron sing, like elves and fairies in a ring, enchanting all that you put in. So check out this foreshadowing. She is, of course, talking about Macbeth. At the beginning, he was not wicked, but he certainly is now. And she foreshadows that he is going to arrive and beyond that, that his whole character has changed. He is now evil. Open locks, whoever knocks. 
How now, you secret black and midnight hags? What is to do? A deed without a name! I conjure you by that which you profess. However you come to know it, answer me. Though you untie the winds and let them fight against the churches, though the yesty waves confound and swallow navigation up, though bladed corn be lodged and trees blown down, though castles topple on the water's heads, though palaces and pyramids do slope their heads to their foundations, though the treasure of nature's Germans tumble all together, even till destruction sicken. Answer me to what I ask. Speak! All right, so he's getting pretty darn cocky here. Yeah, so he shows up and he says, I demand that you tell me um, that you give me the answers to the questions that I now have. Um, the witches, of course, are going to find that actually pretty darn arrogant. And um, he's saying here that he doesn't care what happens in the whole world. He's already uh, disrupted the chain of being, the, the, the natural order of things. So he doesn't care whether, um, you know, the whole world falls to destruction. And these are examples of, of that he gives of how the world could do that. At the very end, he says, um, I don't care if all of nature's Germans, all of the seeds of life tumble and get destroyed, even till the final destruction. I don't really care. Just give me the answer to what I ask of you. So no matter what the consequence is, just answer me and answer me now. Hmm. Cocky. Yes. Well, answer. Say if thou draw me from our mouths or from our masters. Call him. Let me see him. The pouring soul's blood that hath eaten the lying fallow. Grease that's sweating from the murderer's gibbet. Throw in the flame. Come high and low thyself and others. Deathly show. Tell me, thou unknown. He knows my thoughts. Speech, but say thou not. Macbeth, 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 beware, Macduff, beware the pain of fight. It's the first ghost. Whatever thou art, for this good caution, thanks. Thou hast half my fear aright, but one word more. All right, so the first ghost shows up, it's an armed head, right? Um, and he says, beware Macduff, beware the Thane of Fife. Macbeth says, I already know that. Like, this is something that I'm already well aware of. I've already guessed that I need to be really, really cautious of him, right? So they're, they're, they're just planting the seed of false security. Now, the second apparition is of a bloody child. Commanded is another more potent than the first. Macbeth, Macbeth, Macbeth. And I have three years, I hear thee. Be bloody, bold, and resolute. Go after scorn the power of man, for none of woman born shall harm Macbeth. And live, Macduff. What need I fear of thee? But yet I'll make assurance double sure, and take a part of fate. Thou shalt not live, that I may tell pale-hearted fear it lies. All right, so here we see that Mac Macbeth is feeling pretty invincible here, right? If I don't have to worry about anyone born of woman, like no one born of woman can harm me. Well, everyone has a mother. Everyone has been born of woman. So again, he is going to interpret this to mean that he is absolutely invincible. Now he says, um, I already know I need to be aware, you know, be, be um, afraid of Macduff. But I'm going to take it to a new level. I'm going to make sure I just get rid of him. I'm going to murder him. I am going to make sure that he does not live. I'm going to guarantee with a bond of fate that he is killed so that I don't have any worries about him. All right, then the third apparition um, is of a child crowned with a tree in his hand. And sleep in spite of thunder. What is this that rises like the issue of a king? And wears upon his baby prow the crown and top of sovereignty. Listen, but speak now to it. Be lion metal, grow, and take no care who chains, who frets, or where conspirers are. Macbeth shall never vanquished be until great Burnham Wood to high Dunsany. 
name Hill shall come against you. All right, let's take a look at some of these um, uh, annotations here. So stage direction, the armed head could represent, probably represents that of Macbeth, cut off maybe by Macduff, right? We know Macduff is going to name himself uh, Macbeth's nemesis. Stage direction here to a bloody child. This represents Macbeth and contains a clue to the meaning of none of woman, woman born in the prediction that follows. So something about Macduff um, is represented by this bloody child. It has to do with none of woman born. And then right here, a child crowned with a tree in his hand represents Malcolm and contains, contains another clue to the prediction that follows. It suggests that uh, somehow Burnham Wood will come to Dunsinane in some way. Okay, so again, here we see that the uh, witches are creating false security, right? Because the, the witches have said before um, that we all know security is humans' chiefest um, uh, vanity. All right, let's go. Um, Macbeth, Macbeth here um, is going to take a look at the three prophecies. And as I said before, they're going to make Macbeth feel invincible, like he's untouchable. Now, I want to point out here, and we'll talk about this on the next page too. Duncan, we knew, was too trusting. He chose to uh, go to Macbeth's castle and sleep there. Too trusting. Not only just of Macbeth, he was too trusting of the original Thane of Cawdor as well, who betrayed him. So that led him to his fatal destruction. It was his fatal flaw. Macbeth here, we're going to see his fatal flaw is going to be that he is too confident in what the witches have to say. Okay, so let's take a look at how he is pretty darn arrogant, pretty confident. That will never be. Who can impress the forest, bid the tree unfix his earthbound root? Sweet boatman's good. Rebellion's head rise never till the wood of Burnham rise. And our high-placed Macbeth shall live the lease of nature, pay his breath to time and mortal custom. All right, so I'm just going to turn right now to the map of... Um, at the very beginning here. So I told you at the beginning that you needed to take note of these uh, of these places. So here we have Burnham, uh, Burnham Hill, and then we have Burnham Wood right here. And then we have Dunsinane, and we have Glams. Now we know that Macbeth's father, uh, Sinel, was the original Thane of Glams. He died, and now Macbeth is the Thane of Glams. So he is now at Glam's. He's moved from Inverness, which is his original castle. And he has moved to Glam's. And uh, the witches have said, he will never vanquished be, he will never be conquered until Burnham Wood somehow um, is alive and starts moving toward the castle. So Macbeth starts to think, I'm untouchable. The wood will never grow feet and start walking toward the castle. So he says this is um, a really good prediction, a really good prophecy for him. Yeah, so that's what he means here. Sweet prophecies, good rebellion. Um, it will never uh, rise, never till the wood of Burnham rise. So it'll never happen, he says. That'll just never happen. So again, he feels invincible. He feels pretty untouchable. Um, so then he asks, all right, all of these prophecies are really good. I, I'm happy with them. But he says, but tell me one last thing. I need to know. My heart throbs to know one thing. Tell me, if you can, shall Banquo's issue, Banquo's children, ever reign in this kingdom? Will Banquo's son ever be on the throne like their sons? Which was part of the original prediction, right? So again, he says, I will be satisfied. Deny me this and an eternal curse fall on you. Now, this is important because a little bit later on, he's going to repeat something very similar and he's going to actually end up cursing himself in the process. Yeah. Okay, let's keep going. My heart throbs to know one thing. Tell me if your heart can tell so much. Shall Banquo's issue of a reign in this kingdom? Seek to know no more! I will be satisfied. 
deny me this, and an eternal curse fall upon you. Let me know. Why sakes that cauldron? What noise is this? Show, 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 show his eyes and grieve his heart. Come like shadows, so we part. Thou oh, art too like the spirit of Blackfall Town. All right, so eight kings appear, um, ghostly kings. And they pass over the stage in order, the last with a glass with a mirror. That's what it means, a mirror here in his hand. Banquo's ghost following. So there are eight kings following that look like Fleance and, Mick and Banquo. And then it ends with Banquo's ghost. So let's take a look here at the annotation. All right, so he says here earlier, um, he wants to know one thing. Um, oh, shall live the lease of nature. So here he's talking about the normal length of time. He has disrupted the chain of being, the natural order of things. So time and fortune or fortuna is in charge now. So let's take a look here. When he sees the eight kings, the eight ghosts, he says, oh, you are too like the spirit of Banquo. This is actually a tip of, of the hat of respect to King James, who was currently um, on the throne in England at the time when Macbeth, sorry, when Shakespeare wrote Macbeth. So each of the kings looks like Banquo. The kings that Macbeth is shown actually represent the Stuart dynasty. It was believed that Fleance escaped to Wales and married a Welsh princess. Their descendant, Walter, um, returned to Scotland and became Lord Stuart, founder of the Stuarts, the monarchs of Scotland. Now the eighth Stuart King James became actually King James I of England in 1603 when Elizabeth died. All English monarchs since then have actually been his descendants. So this whole idea that the witches have um, predicted that Fleance will actually father a line of kings into eternity is true. How do the witches know that? Hmm. So again, yeah, so even to this day, the, uh, the, the um, descendants are from this Stuart line. All right, so a little bit, a little bit uh, further ahead here, um, he is going to, Macbeth, is going to take a look at um, how he feel. Well, let's keep going. Okay. I crown the sea of my eyeballs, and my hair all on the gold bound brows like the first, a third like the former. Filthy hags, why do you show me this? Four star eyes. What will the line stretch out to the crack of doom? Another yet, a seventh. I'll see no more. And yet the eighth appears who bears a glass which shows me many more. And some I see the two tall balls and treble scepters carry. Now I see it is true. For the blood bolt of Bankwell smiles at me and points at them for his. All right, so here he sees, he's watching the eight ghosts, right? And the ghosts represent um, the children and the grandchildren, sorry, the child of Bankwell Fleance, and uh, Binko's grandchildren into, you know, uh, into eternity, it seems like, um, that they are going to hold the throne of England. Um, and again, we've already discussed this, that is still true to the day. What this prompts Macbeth to do is to realize that he has actually driven himself crazy for Banquo, for all of Banquo's descendants. Because of course, Macbeth doesn't have any children to take over the throne, right? So let's take a look here at what it says here. Twofold balls and scepter, treble scepters. These are coronation emblems, the orb and staff. James the sixth of Scotland was crowned twice at Scone uh, and Westminster, England, and became officially king of three countries. So he was, he's, uh, King of Great Britain, France, and Ireland. Interesting. Okay, so let's keep going here. Out of the sight! What is this so? Hi, sir, all this is so! But why stands Macbeth thus amazedly? Come, sisters, cheer we up as sprites and show the best of our delights. 
All right, so the first switch says, why are you so confused? We already told you this. Did you think we were lying to you? Right, the funny thing is, is of course, they only were telling him half truths, right? Um, he realizes all, everything he has done has been for nothing, all for Banquo. So he has lost his mind, lost his morality, all for Banquo's um, um, issue. Yeah. Okay, let's keep going here. I'm charmed here to give a sound that you may perform your antic round. But this great king may kindly say, our duties did he welcome pay? And then they vanish. <laughs> This pernicious hour stand I closer than the calendar. Come in without saying. What's your braces? All right, so he has foreshadowed here. He says, Let this fatal hour stand accursed. So he is cursing himself, right? Uh, not only that, he's going to curse himself a little bit later on as well. I saw you with the weird sisters. No, my lord. Came in a pile. No, indeed. Infected be the air whereon they ride and damned all those that trust them. All right, so here's where he actually damns himself. So he says, uh, he's trying to place a curse on them. He says, infected be the air whereon they ride, the witches. And he says, and damned all those that trust him, trust them. Now, he falls into that category, right? So it's ironic. He trusts them, and so he actually damns himself. He um, fully trusts them, not thinking about himself here. Yeah. I did hear the galloping of horse. Who was came by? Tis two or three, my lord, who bring you word that Duff is fled to England. Fled to England, my lord. Time thou anticipates my dread exploits. A flighty purpose never is or took unless the deed goes with it. All right. He is not happy about uh, about Macduff. He said in the uh, in the previous act that he was going to kill Macduff. He didn't. He did not act fast enough, because if he would have just acted fast enough, he would have been able to kill Macduff, and he would never have made it to England, right? So he's really upset that he did not kill Macduff, and a little bit later on, he is going to vow to get revenge on Macduff, right? Um, the the um, revenge that he is going to get on Macduff is actually what we are going to categorize as his third great crime. Again, his first great crime was the killing of Duncan, his um, his relative and his king. Um, and then the second great crime, of course, was the killing of Banquo, his fellow general and, uh, and friend, right? And now this third great crime. Now, this third great crime is actually his worst crime. He is now an emotionally dead monster. He hits a new low here, almost like sociopathic. He seems to have absolutely no remorse uh, because he is now going to kill innocent women, children, and even servants in the house of, in the castle of Macduff at Fife. So a little bit uh, later on right here, he's going to say, um, Macduff? Oh, he escaped without me killing him. And he is going to announce from this point on, I will act immediately. I will act on impulse. I did not act fast enough here and I let him get away. He says, but from this moment on, flighty purpose is going to be how I'm going to act. I'm gonna act immediately. The very firstlings of my heart shall be the firstlings of my hand. So he said, the first, the first time I get an idea to do something in my heart, I'm gonna act with my hand immediately. So let's take a look here at the annotations. Um, unless one acts immediately, one never carries out what's one's intentions. So he says here, I shall act as soon as I have an idea. I shall act on impulse. All right. So this is what he announces to everybody. Um, or not to everybody, actually to nobody but himself. It's an aside. Okay. So, um, and again, this is his third great crime. He's going to say, the castle of Macduff, I will surprise Nobody will know, I'm just gonna surprise attack. Seize upon Fife, give to the edge of the sword his wife, 
his children, and all unfortunate souls that trace him in his line. So anybody in his castle, he's just going to, he's going to kill them. Now, these people are completely innocent. The wife has nothing to do with um, his being, you know, flying to England, not flying really, but um, hurrying off to England. His children, and my God, the servants have nothing to do with it. But again, this is his third great crime. And we're going to see here. It's his worst crime. He is now an emotionally dead monster. He's killing innocent women, children, and even the servants. So he says here, from this point on, I'm just gonna go ahead and do whatever comes into my mind right away. And right now, I feel like I'm gonna kill everybody in his family to get back at him for betraying me. And again, Macduff is a traitor to the king. So in this way, we see Macduff and Macbeth are similar in that they have both chosen to betray the current king. They are both traitors. Um, now that's not the only thing that is similar about them or different. Um, okay, so he's going to kill all of Macduff, anybody in Macduff's castle. He's not going to take a moment to boast about it. He's just going to go ahead and do it. This deed I'll do before I even stop thinking about it. Nice guy. From this moment, the very first things of my heart shall be the first things of my hand. And even now, to crown my thoughts with acts, be it thought and done. The castle of Macduff I will surprise, seize upon Fife, give to the edge of the sword his wife, his babes, and all unfortunate souls that trace him in his line. No boasting like a fool. This deed I'll do before the purpose cool. But no more sight. All right, so act four, scene two, in this scene, Ross, another uh, thane, a, a nobleman, visits his relative, Lady Mac Macduff. So we know that her husband, Macduff, has already fled to England, right? And he has made a fatal, fatal error here. He has chosen to leave his family behind. Now, in that moment, he had to make a choice. Is he going to be loyal to his family? Um, and if he was, he could go to the castle and be loyal to his family. But um, in all likelihood, Macbeth would kill them, right? So in a moment of decision, he made a fatal error. He chose to go to England and not bring his family. Um, so we're going to see again here that this was a fatal error on his part. Ross visits his relative Lady Macduff in her castle at Fife, hoping to assure her that Macduff's flight to England was for really good valid reasons. She, however, does not accept Ross's arguments. She's hurt. She feels really abandoned. For she and her children are now very vulnerable, meaning no one is there to protect them, right? After Ross leaves, Lady Macduff and her son discuss treason. Uh, again, treason here is going against your king, which is what both Macbeth did and Macduff now has done, right? And related matters, and she is amused by her son's intelligent and perceptive comments. An unidentified messenger comes or arrives to warn Lady Macduff of danger, but he comes too late. And again, this, this adds to all of this suspense, right? The murderers burst in, they stab the child, and they pursue the screaming Lady Macduff. So again, as we know, this is Macbeth's third great crime. It shows how far he has now sunk in, um, in you know, his ability to do horrific things. Okay, so I'm just going to rewind this a little bit here. On my thoughts with acts. Be it thought and done. The castle of Macduff I will surprise, seize upon Fife, give to the edge of the sword his wife, his babes, and all unfortunate souls that trace him in his line. No boasting like a fool. This deed I'll do before the purpose cool. But no more sight. While well, these gentlemen come bring me where they are. <laughs> what had he done to make him fly the land? You must have patience, son. He had none? His flight was madness. When our actions do not, our fears do make us traitors. You know not whether it was his wisdom or his fear. Wisdom? 
to leave his wife, to leave his babes, his mansion and his titles in a place from whence himself does fly. He loves us not. All right. So here, um, she is feeling very abandoned. He, he obviously has not had any contact with her. She has just found out probably secondhand that he's taken off. Um, so she accuses him, she accuses her husband as being disloyal and unloving. Um, this, is, this is a serious thing, that he has abandoned them with no one to protect them. Um, so again, he is, by definition, a traitor to the country but not just the country. She's suggesting here that he is also a traitor to his family. Yeah, he should not just have loyalty to the country. Um, he should have loyalty to his family. And we're gonna find out um, that this is indeed a fatal error. He loves us not. She says, he wants the natural touch. So let's take a look here at what it says in the annotations. He lacks the natural human affection. Um, so again, she's going to say, such an irrational departure shows no love or wisdom, but only fear for himself. So he, she's going to say, he's been, he's been selfish and disloyal to us, thinking only of himself. Um, but what Ross is there to say is that, no, he actually is thinking about the whole country. He's not being selfish. Ross is actually suggesting that he's being selfless, actually. Yeah, she doesn't see it that way though. Not at all. He wants the natural touch. For the poor wren, the most diminutive of birds will fight her young ones in her nest against the owl. All is the fear and nothing is the love. As little is the wisdom when the flight so runs against all reason. My dearest cuz, I pray you school yourself. But for your husband, he... All right, so Lady McDuff is saying here, you know, like he left us. He didn't even tell us what was going on. He just abandoned us here. He, he's like, he doesn't even, you know, feel any natural love for us, for, like to protect us. And she says, even the poor bird, a wren, the smallest of birds will fight to the death to protect, you know, the baby birds. So she's saying, ah, he doesn't love us. He, he doesn't love us at all. He just took off. And of course, there's not much that Ross can do to convince her. He's noble, wise, judicious, and best knows the fits of the season. I dare not speak much further. But cruel are the times when we are traitors and do not know ourselves. When we hold rumor from what we fear, yet know not what we fear, but float upon a wild and violent sea each way and move. I take my leave of you. It shall not be long, but I'll be here again. Things at the worst will cease, or else climb upward to what they were before. All right, so we know that this is actually dramatic irony. He says, I take my leave of you, but I won't be long. I'll be here again. Hmm. Um, things at the worst will cease. So, so things cannot get any worse. He says they might even climb upward. They might even improve, right? Not going to happen. He, he leaves her with a blessing. But this again is ironic, because we know Macbeth is on the hunt. My pretty cuz, blessing upon me. Father he is, and yet he's fatherless. I am so much a fool, should I stay longer, it would be my disgrace and your discomfort. I take my leave at once. So he leaves. Now. How okay, so she he's not literally dead. She's saying he is figuratively dead to her. And what are you going to do now? How will you live without a father? He has abandoned us here. Now, the son's um, response actually is quite um, uh, quite witty and um, and intelligent. And she's she's going to be impressed by his his responses. How will you live? As birds do life. What, with worms and flies? With what I get, I mean, and so do they. Poor bird, thou'lt never fear the net nor lime, the pitfall nor the gin. Why should I, mother? Poor birds, they are not set for. My father's not dead for all your sake. Yes, he is dead. How wilt thou do for a father? 
with all thy wit, and get in faith with wit enough for thee. Was my father a traitor, mother? Aye, that he was. Technically, he yes. Traitor? Why, one that swears and lies. And be all traitors that do so? Everyone that does so is a traitor and must be hanged. All right. So she is clearly quite disappointed in her husband. And she says, uh, yes, yes, your father technically... He is a traitor. He has gone against the current king, Macbeth, of Scotland. Now, she obviously is not really truly aware of everything that's going on, or else maybe she would be a little bit more understanding and maybe even supportive. So she says, yes, a traitor is one that swears and lies, breaks an oath to the king. And so, yes, um, he is definitely a traitor. But she has suggested up here that he's also a traitor to the family, right? And must they all be hanged that swear and lie? Every one. Who must hang them? Why, the honest men. Then the liars and swears are false, for there are liars and swears enough to beat the honest men. Hang up them. Now, oh, God help thee, poor monkey. But how wilt thou do for a father? If he were dead, you'd weep for him. If you were not, it would be a good sign that I should quickly have a new father. Poor Prattler, how thou talkst! This she fair dame, I am not to you down, though in your state of honor I am perfect. I thought some danger does approach you dearly. If you will take a homely man's advice, be not found to hence with your little ones. Who bright you thus methinks I am who savage? To do as to you a fell cruelty which is too nigh your perfect. Heaven preserve you, I dare no longer stay. All right, so this messenger, again, this messenger shows up to add to the suspense, right? So um, she already knows that they are unattended. They're un, like, there's nobody there to, to defend them should anything happen. Uh, the messenger shows up, and again, this adds to the suspense. Like, get out of here, he says. Um, even though you don't know who I am, I am acting very, very loyally to you. Uh, get out of here. Just get out of here. He is, however, too late. Lady Macduff says, why should I leave? I, I've done nothing wrong. I'm not going to leave here. I, I'm not going to be afraid if I have done nothing wrong. So she says, but I remember now, I'm, I'm, a, I'm in this earthly world uh, where to do no harm is often laudable and to do good, sometimes accounted dangerous folly. So she does get it. She says, even though I haven't done anything wrong, uh, I'm in this crazy world right now where when you're good, it looks like you're doing harm. And even when you're when you're doing harm, it looks like you are doing good. So again, uh, referring to this appearance versus reality. And again, this uh, refers to, or you know, it certainly hints at this idea that fair is foul and foul is fair. So she says, I guess, you know what? The fact that I haven't done anything wrong is not going to protect me. Evil is sometimes stronger. Yeah. And the murders, murderers show up right away. Whither should I fly? I have done no harm. But I remember now, I am in this earthly world, where to do harm is often laudable, to do good sometime account a dangerous folly. Why then, alas, do I put up that womanly defense to say I have done no harm? Murderers. What are these faces? Where is your husband? I hope in no place so unsanctified where such as thou mayst find him. He is a traitor. Thou lies, thou shag-eared villain. What you made, young fry of treachery. He stabs them. Mother, run away, I does seek out some desolate. All right. So in this case, we see that only Macduff's son is murdered on stage. And again, this is one of the questions in your study package. Why? Well, number one, logistically on stage, it might be hard logistically, as I said, uh, with, you know, the to enact all the blood. At number two, left to the imagination, it is often more horrific. And then number three, it creates huge suspense. Yeah. All right. Let's take a look here at... Act 4, Scene 3. 
In this scene, Macduff has arrived at the court of Edward the Confessor, the King of England. He meets Malcolm and attempts to convince him that they should prepare to invade Scotland. However, Malcolm points out that he would be foolish to accept unquestioningly Macduff's appearance of loyalty. So again, um, we know that Malcolm is the natural king. He is the successor. He's been named. He is the natural king. So according to the chain of being, the natural king needs to get onto the throne so that Scotland can then experience peace, right? The fact that the king that is currently on the throne, Macbeth, has got there by um, evil means, um, unnatural means, has resulted in much chaos in, um, in Scotland. So Malcolm says, why the heck should I trust you, Macduff? I don't know whether maybe Mac Macbeth like sent you here to kill me. So he is not going to make the same foolish mistake that his father made. His father's fatal flaw was to be too trusting. He was way too trusting of the first thing of Cawdor, and then way too trusting of the second thing of Cawdor, Macbeth. So Malcolm here, it's really important that he um, establish that Macduff can truly be um, trusted. Now he is going to put a few tests on Macduff to ensure that he truly can be test tested. <clears throat> By doing this, we see that Malcolm um, establishes that he is going to be a good king. He is not going to be too trusting and he certainly is not going to be too confident either. All right. The shade of their wheat was their bosoms empty. Let us rather Oops, hold fast. Sorry, that's um. Let, let me just finish reading this and then we'll get right into the text. Um, <clears throat> so Malcolm points out that he would be foolish to accept unquestioningly <clears throat> Macduff's appearance of loyalty. He describes in vivid detail the kind of king he would be corrupt, greedy, lecherous, and vicious. Now, this is not really true. This is all just a test that he is going to put to Macduff. He's going to pretend that he is a, would be a terrible king and see Macduff's reaction to see if Macduff is truly loyal or not. Now, eventually, the horrified Macduff prepares to leave, convinced that neither Scotland nor he himself can be saved. Malcolm's test has succeeded. Now able to accept Macduff's integrity, he withdraws all the accusations he has made against himself and describes the way he really is. He is actually virtuous, honest, loyal, and ready to serve his country. He further informs Macduff that an English army force of 10,000 soldiers is ready right now to invade Scotland, thanks to, of course, the um, the king of England at the time, Edward the Confessor. Now, this Edward the Confessor, I just want to tell you a little bit about him. The, uh, the people at the time viewed him as a saint, and not just as a saint, as someone who had um, like special God-given abilities to heal the sick. All right. Malcolm praises King Edward's piety, his royalness, and his... Um, uh, like Christianity and royal virtues and describes his special ability to prophecy and to heal those afflicted, afflicted with scrofula, which is a form of tuber tuberculosis. Ross arrives from Scotland and speaks of the worsening horrors of Macbeth's tyranny. Unable at first to deal with Macduff's inquiries about the safety of his family, he does finally break the news of their murder. Macduff's overwhelming Sorrow gradually gives way to a determination to confront, and not just confront, but to kill Macbeth. So in this moment, when he finds out that his family has been murdered, he vows to be Macbeth's nemesis. Yeah, nemesis. All right, so let's keep going here. We are in England before the King's Palace. Enter Malcolm and Macduff. Now, a couple of things I just want to establish here. So we, we did talk about this. Malcolm, sorry, Duncan, uh, the first king here, was too trusting. This was his fatal flaw. We're going to find that Macbeth's fatal flaw is actually that he is too confident. He's too cocky. He's too arrogant. 
the new king, whoever this king is, and we're assuming that's probably going to be Malcolm, as he is the Prince of Cumberland, he has been named successor. Uh, the new king, therefore, must be able to balance these two things. He must be also a natural king. So he cannot be too trusting, yet he cannot be too confident. So Malcolm here is unsure whether Macduff is sent by Macbeth, as Macbeth has already tried to get to him before. So he's, Mac, Macbeth has already sent people to kill Malcolm. So he is now not going to be too trusting. Uh, maybe Mac, Macbeth did send Macduff to kill him. So he needs to make sure that Malcolm, sorry, that Macduff is indeed loyal and trustworthy. So that's why he's going to test him here. At the very beginning here, Macduff shows up and um, Malcolm says, well, that's just terrible. I, I'm so sorry to hear what's going on in Scotland, but I, I am not really in a position to do anything, he says. I'm just going to kind of sit here and cry. And Mal Macduff is going to say, what do you mean you're just going to sit there and cry? Stand and defend our native land. You are the natural king. You need to do that. And Malcolm is going to say, "Well, I don't really think that's what I'm, I'm, you know, made to do. I'm just going to sit around and see what happens." Now, this is going to enrage Macduff. We know that Macduff actually is noble and loyal. He is going to um, try to encourage Malcolm to step up to the plate. He's going to say, Malcolm, no, you can do this. I believe in you. You can be a good king. Um, and Malcolm is going to say, nah, I, I'm not. I'm not really cut out to be a good king. And then a little bit later on, he's going to say, in fact, if anything, I'm, I would be a terrible king. Like, if you think Macbeth is a terrible tyrant... <laughs> you should wait and see what kind of king I would be. I would be a million times worse than Macbeth. Now, of course, he's telling lies about himself. Truth versus reality, right? Appearance versus reality. Um, or fair is foul and foul is fair. He's appearing to look foul when really he is fair. And the truth will come out. Um, but again, this is all a test. He is not going to make the same mistake as his father. He will not be too trusting. All right, I just am going to rewind this a bit. But no belief. And what I can redress as I shall find the time to friend, I will. What you have spoken it may be so perchance. This tyrant is so named. Sorry, rewind it. Oh, I am in this earthly world. Where to do harm is often laudable, to do good sometime account a dangerous folly. Why, then, alas, do I put up that womanly defense to say I have done no harm? What are these faces? Where is your husband? I hope in no place so unsanctified where such as thou mayst find him. He is a traitor. Thou mayst, thou shame-geared villain. What you made, young fry of treachery! Yes, Seek out some desolate shade and there weep our sad bosoms empty. Let us rather hold fast the mortal sword. Like good men, we stride our downfall burden. Each new morn, new widows howl, new orphans cry, new sorrows strike heaven on the face that it resounds as if it felt with Scotland and yelled out like syllable of dolor. What I believe. All right, so again, Malcolm says, Oh, that's just terrible what's happening in Scotland, but I'm just going to sit here and cry. And Macduff says, no, you don't understand. We need to stand and defend our native land. He says every single day, you know, people are made widows and, and you know, orphans are made because the fathers are being killed. New sorrows strike heaven on the face that it makes, um, it makes Scotland be full of wails of grief. So somebody needs to come and save Scotland is what Macduff is saying. Uh, it, it's you, Malcolm. You need to come and save Scotland. And he says, I don't think I'm the right person. I just don't think I'm the right person. Again, this is all not true. He's pretending because he's testing Macduff. So again, so um, he says, yeah, this tyrant Macbeth, he, um, sure, his name uh, blisters our tongue. And, but he was originally at one time thought to be honest. And I loved him well. He hasn't touched you yet, which is dramatic irony, because we, of course, know Macbeth actually has. He's killed his family. 
So Mal Malcolm says here, I'm young, um, but I know that you may deserve of him through me and wisdom to offer up a weak, poor, innocent lamb to appease an angry, an angry God. So Malcolm says, look, maybe for all I know, Macbeth has sent you here to try to kill me like a, like a lamb and then bring me like a dead lamb to the angry God, Macbeth. How do I know I can trust you, in other words? <clears throat> so let's take a look. You may betray me to buy yourself back into Macbeth's favor. Yeah. Given in, or you may give in to the pressure of a royal command from Macbeth. Maybe Macbeth sent you here to kill me. How do I know that, that you can be trusted? <clears throat> so, um, a little bit later on, Macbeth is going to say, I am not treacherous. And Malcolm is going to say, but Macbeth is. For sure he is. You may want to get back into his good books, right? You may give in to the pressure of all of that. And he says, Malcolm says, hey, look, even the brightest angel, um, again, in the Bible, uh, being looked at as a text, the brightest angel, Lucifer, fell from God's grace. So he says, you know, it's not unheard of that really good people can fall from God's grace. Macduff had expected to be warmly received by Malcolm. Instead, Malcolm is suspicious of his motives. And again, this is really important because he cannot make the same mistakes as his father. Now, I want to also point out here that in this, um, in this section here, we're going to see some references to Machiavellianism. And again, that is when the end justifies the means. The end doesn't justify the means um, is what we call reverse Machiavellianism. Uh, what is in the heart should dictate the proper end. So again, yes, this is reverse Machiavellianism. So we're going to see that this reverse Machiavellianism is actually going to help heal the country of Scotland from the tyrant Macbeth. All right. Vile whales, but no belief. And what I can redress as I shall find the time to friend, I will. What you have spoken it may be so perchance. This tyrant, whose sole name blisters our tongues, was once thought honest. You have loved him well. He hath not touched you yet. I am young. But something you may deserve of him through me and wisdom to offer up a weak, poor, innocent lamb to appease an angry god. I am not treacherous. But Macbeth is. A good and virtuous nature may recoil in an imperial charge. But I shall crave your pardons. That which you are, my thoughts cannot transpose. Angels are bright still, though the brightest fell. Though all things foul would wear the brows of grace, yet grace must still look so. I have lost my hopes. A chance even there where I did fight my doubts. All right, so Macduff at this point is going to look at this test and he's going to say, if, if you're not going to do anything, if you're just going to sit here and do nothing and let Scotland be ruled by this tyrant, I have lost all of my hope. Yeah, all of my hope. So Macduff had expected to be warmly received, but that's not what's happening. Okay. Why in that rawness left you wife and child? Those precious motives, those strong nuts of love without leave taking. <clears throat> I pray you, let not my jealousies be your dishonest, but mine own safeties. You may be rightly just whatever I shall think. All right. So he says here, look, if you really can be trusted, why would you leave your wife and child to the motives of Macbeth? I think it's possible that maybe you are working with Macbeth and you felt like it was safe to leave them there. So why uh, did you choose to defend your country over your family? Right? So again, this is all a test. So then he says, please do not let my suspicions make you seem dishonorable. I'm just protecting myself. I need to be cautious. So just tell me the truth. All right. <clears throat> to this, though, Macduff is going to lose hope, right? Bleed, bleed, poor country of Scotland. There's no hope. Great tyranny... <clears throat> which is, <clears throat> sorry, is represented by Macbeth, 
You, thou lay thy basis sure, the, for goodness dares not check on thee. Goodness, again, being represented here by Malcolm. Malcolm will not come to your aid. So you are just going to bleed and bleed and bleed. And he is truly, truly in uh, sorrow over his country. He loses hope very sincerely. Yeah. Bleed. Bleed, poor country. Great tyranny, lay thou thy bases sure, for goodness dare not check thee. Where are thy wrongs? The title is a fear. Fare thee well, Lord. I would not be the villain that thou thinkst for the whole space that's in the tyrant's grasp and the riches to boot. Being other All right, so here we see <clears throat> that Macduff is being um, contrasted to Macbeth, right? So here we see Macduff says, I would not betray my country, not if all of the land and even the land to the east was given to me, right? So he is loyal to his country. And again, we see that Macbeth is not. So they are contrasting figures here, contrasting characters. Offended. I speak not as an absolute fear of you. I think our country sinks beneath the yoke. It weeps, it bleeds, and each new day gashes added to our wounds. I think with all there would be hands uplifted in my right. And here from gracious England have I offer a goodly thousands. But for all this, when I shall tread upon the tyrant's head, or wear it on my sword. Yet my poor country shall have more vices than before, more suffering, more sundry ways than ever by him that shall succeed. All right, so this is, the, this is like a continuation of the test. So he says, I don't disagree with you, Macduff. Yeah, our country sinks beneath the yoke of Macbeth's tyranny. Yeah, I, I agree with you on that. It weeps, it bleeds, and every day it gets worse. He says, look, I have actually um, arranged to have a goodly thousand, thousands of reliable troops are actually ready to invade Scotland. He says, yes, I agree. Macbeth is a tyrant, but <laughs> as soon as I get rid of Macbeth, I am going to be an even worse king than him. So this again is one more test of Macduff, a continuation of it. So he says, uh, yeah, I, I, I'm going to have, you know, we're ready to invade and we're going to win. But you, it will be a terrible thing when I get on the throne. He wants to test, he wants to test Macbeth's reaction. Um, does he really love his country? Is he really that loyal? Yeah. So he says, my country will have more vices than it had before. And by me, because I am going to be a terrible, terrible king. What should it be? It is myself I be, in whom I know all the particulars of vice so grafted, that when they shall be opened, black Macbeth will seem as pure as snow, and the state esteem him as a lamb being compared with my confineless heart. No. All right, so Malcolm here says, look, my personality actually is so evil, like it's well established. Um, I have so many vices, so many evil things about me. He says, when it comes down to it, Black Macbeth is actually going to look pure as snow compared to me. So again, we have appearance versus reality, right? And he says, I have confineless harms. I have boundless sins. You thought Macbeth was bad? Ha! You wait till I take the throne. So Macduff is at first going to question this. He's going to be like, no flipping way. Is that even possible that anyone could even, that could be worse than Macbeth? It's not even flipping possible. But Malcolm is going to say, oh yes, I am way worse. He says, I am more bloody. I am more lustful. I am more filled with greed. I am false. I'm lying. I act impulsively. I am malicious. Um, smacking of every sin that has a name. There's no bottom to how sinful and evil I would be on the throne. Now, this is going to actually spin Macduff into a bit of, um, of a hopeless little spin, right? He's come there to hope that, Mac that, um, that Malcolm is going to come and save the day. And now he's going to lose all hope. 
Not in the legions of hard hell can come a devil more damned in evils to top Macbeth. I grant him blood, luxurious, avaricious, false, deceitful, sudden, malicious, smacking of every sin that has a name. But there's no bottom, none in my voluptuousness. Your wives, your daughters, your matrons and your maids could not fill up the cistern of my lust. And my desire, all continent impediments would all bear that did oppose my will. Better make Beth than such a one to reign. Okay, so again, this is not true. He says, I am so lustful that I would take your wives and your daughters and your matrons and your maids, anybody who's female, and I would have my way with them. So he says, and anybody who went, went against me, I would restrain them, put them in jail, or kill them. If they didn't agree to letting me have my way with your wife, your daughter, he, he's saying he's 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 like a sexual sexually aberrant, um, but he's not right. He's this is all a lie. It is uh, reality versus um, um, a falsehood. Yeah. Boundless and temperance in nature is a tyranny. Between the untimely emptying of the happy throne and fall of many kings. But fear not yet to take upon you what is yours. You may convey your pleasures in a spacious temple, and yet seem cold the time you may so hope for We have willing dames enough, who there cannot be that vulture in which to devour so many as will to greatness dedicate themselves, finding it so inclined. With this there grows in my most ill composed affection. Such a staunchless avarice. Okay, so Macduff says, no, you can't be that bad. He says, don't let your lust make you make you believe you can't be a good king. You can, you can, you know, um, fulfill all your fantasies, but still be a really good king. He says, many kings have done that. Malcolm is going to say, no, you don't understand. I am such an evil character that I have an insatiable greed. The more I obtain, the more I want. So it's not just like sexually I'm going to take advantage of people, but I'm also going to steal people's um, jewels and their land. And um, and Macduff, Macduff is going to say, again, but we have lots of land. I'm not worried about that. You can still be a good king. Um, and then Malcolm is going to say, look, this is a definition of a good king right here. And he's going to list some characteristics. And he's going to say, I have none of these characteristics of a good king. You want to pretend that I'm going to be a good king, but I don't have any of these virtues, he says. These are the virtues appropriate for a king, but I have none of them. But what I king, I should cut off the nobles for their lands, desire his jewels and this other's wealth. My more having would be as a source to make me hunger more. That I should forge quarrels unjust against the good and loyal, destroying them for wealth. Savarus sticks deeper. Grows with more pernicious root than summer seeming lust. And it hath been the sword of our slain kings. Yet do not fear. Scotland have poisons to fill up your will of your mere own. Oh, these are portable with other graces, where I have none. A king becoming graces, such as justice, verity, temperance, stableness, bounty, perseverance, mercy, lowliness, devotion, patience, courage, fortitude. I have no relish of them, but are found in the division of each several crime, acting it many ways. Nay, had I power, I should pour the sweet milk of concord into hell, uproar the universal peace, confound all unity on earth, Stop them, stop them. If such an one be fit to govern, speak. I am as I have spoken. <laughs> all right, so this is the final test here. Mac Malcolm says, hey, look, all of those uh, characteristics of a good king, that definition of a good king, I'm none of it. In fact, um, I will make Scotland hell, he says. I will take all of the sweet milk of peacefulness and turn it into hell. Hell even more hell in Scotland than you have now. So Macduff says, oh, Scotland, oh, Scotland. So he is, he is genuinely um, suffering over the fact that Scotland cannot be saved.
right? So Malcolm says, look, this is who I really am. What do you think about that? And then Macduff here, we're going to take a look here. Macduff's emotional breakdown and sorrow over Malcolm's apparent disloyalty to Scotland finally convinces Malcolm that Macduff is loyal. So he has an emotional breakdown right here in this bubble um, to, to govern. He says, no, not to live. He says, I give up. I just give up. To govern. No, not to live. A nation miserable, with an untitled tyrant body scepter. When shalt thou see thy wholesome days again? Since at the truest issue of thy throne, by his own interdiction, stands accursed, and does blaspheme his brain. Thy royal father was a most saintly king. The queen that bore thee often upon her knees, and on her feet, died every day she lived. Have thee well. These evils are repeated upon thyself, have banished me from Scotland. My breast, I open here. My dove. All right, so he's finally, he's going to pass the test here. So this emotional breakdown here is going to finally convince Malcolm, all right, I, I do trust you. I do trust you. And then he's going to share the plan. He's going to come clean. So Macduff says, no, you're not fit to govern. In fact, you're not even fit to live. You're a terrible person. I give up hope uh, for my nation. Miserable, miserable nation that is now going to be ruled by an unnatural tyrant, Macbeth, right? Again, we know it's important that the king be a natural king so that peace can finally come to Scotland. Um, yeah, so... Um, he's saying, no, you're dishonorable. Your father would be so disappointed in you and your mother too. And he says, in fact, I am, I'm, I'm so disappointed in you that I'm, I'm leaving. I'm out of here. Fare thee well. These evils that you, that you repeat have banished me from Scotland. I, I can never go back to Scotland. My family is dead for one thing. Um, and, um, well, I don't know if he, I don't know that he knows that yet. Um, but he's saying, I give up. Oh, my breast. Oh, my heart. My hope ends here. I give up. Now, this has convinced Malcolm that he is trustworthy. So Malcolm is going to tell him his whole plan now. This noble passion, child of integrity, have from my soul wiped the black scruples. I believe you now. And reconciled my thoughts to thy good truths and honor. Devilish Macbeth, by many of these trains, hath sought to win me into his power, and modest wisdom plucks me from over-credulous haste. All right, so this is a really important quote here. It is the reason why Malcolm has to test Macduff, because Macbeth has already sent a whole bunch of people. Devilish Macbeth has already sent people to trick him to kill him to pluck me from my overcredulous haste. So he says, I need to be really careful. Macbeth has already tried to kill me. So how did I know? I had to test you, Macduff, because maybe you were sent here to kill me too. He says, no, but I believe you now. Your noble passion, your emotional breakdown here has convinced me. He says, this is what's happening now. So he says, um, I'm already on it. Plans are set in motion. We are going to invade Scotland. And um, he says, look, I, I lied about myself to you. I had to. He says, I am none of those things. He says, I'm not lustful. I'm not greedy. He says, in fact, if anything, I'm a virgin. This is who I really am. I am going to be a really good king. I just had to prove that I wasn't going to be too trusting. Yeah, this is what I am truly. Um, and it's thine and thy, my poor country's to command. So I'm going to be a really good king, he says. Yeah. But God above, deal between thee and me. For even now I put myself to thy direction. Here on speak my own detraction, and abjure the taints and blames I laid upon myself as strangers to my nature. I take it back. I'm none of those things. I am yet unknown to woman. Never was forced. Never born. lied. Scarcely have coveted what was mine. I own. never stole anything. At no time broke my faith. Remained Christian. Would not betray the devil to his fellow. And the like no less in truth than life. Says I'm a good guy. My first fault speaking was this upon myself. 
But I am truly his thine, and my four countries to command. Will there indeed be for thy year approach, Old Sea? All right, so let's take a look here. Um, so when we compare Macduff to Macbeth, we see that they have actually both betrayed the current king right? So they're both traitors, they are. Both believe in the natural order of the chain of being, but Macduff is loyal to his country. Macbeth is not. He's Machiavellian. He's just loyal to himself. However, he started out very honorable and loyal, but because of the influence of the witches, he turned evil. Yeah. So Malcolm is going to explain to Macduff that, um, the country of England has lent them old Seward. Now, who is Seward? Um, Seward is, is he on here? Well, Seward here is um, the, like a legendary um, fighter. So Seward, not just Seward, but 10,000 men, warlike men. We're gonna um, invade Scotland, and we're gonna take back the throne. Yeah, so he says, I'm already at a point, we're fully equipped, we're ready to invade. All that we're doing is just waiting to get the okay from the king. Yeah. Um, so again, here we see reverse Machiavellianism. Um, May our chance of success be equal to the justness of our cause. So um, again, Machiavellianism, the end justifies the means. You're going to do whatever you whatever you have to do to get what you want. This is the opposite of it, that you are going to be just and good, and the result is going to lead you to uh, a fair end. Yeah. See, we're with 10,000 men already at the point we're setting for. Now we're together, and the chance of goodness be like our warranted quarrel. Why are you silent? Such welcome and unwelcome things at once is hard to reconcile. Well, more and on. Comes the king hence, I pray you. Uh, aye, sir. Uh, there are a crew of wretched souls that stay his cure. Uh, their malady convinces that great essay of art. Uh, but uh, such sanctity hath heaven given his hand. They presently are made. I uh, thank you, doctor. All right, so they're talking about here um, about the King of England, Edward the Confessor. Malcolm says, when is the king coming here? We're just waiting for him to give us the okay to invade. And the doctor says, oh, he's been kind of sidetracked. Um, he has a bunch of people who are really sick that need healing. So he is currently healing a bunch of these sick people. And... Uh, um, Macduff's going to say, what, what is he healing? Like, what's the disease that he heals? Um, and Malcolm, Malcolm is going to say, it's called the evil. He heals the evil. Now, this is important to note because this sets up Edward the Confessor, the King of England, as someone who has the power to heal. So he's healing the people in his country. But not only that, he is going to help heal the evil the evil that is in Scotland. So if anybody is able to do it, it is the saintly king, uh, Edward the Confessor, who has these healing qualities that is going to be able to help Malcolm and heal his country. Right. Uh, uh, what's the disease he means? It's called the evil. Most miraculous work in this good king, which I have often since my year remained in England seen him do. How he solicits heaven himself best knows. And strangely visited people, all swollen and ulcerous, he cures, hanging a golden stamp about their necks. And tis spoken to the succeeding royalty, he leaves these healing benediction. And with this strange virtue, sundry blessings hang about his throne that speak him full of grace. There's a sacred power to heal. See, who comes here? My cousin, but yet I know him not. My own gentle cousin, welcome hither. I know him now. All right, so let's take a look at the annotations here. Um, so this evil, the evil, scrofula, a, tubu a, a tub tuberculosis, kind of a swelling, 
tuberculous, swelling of the lymph glands in the neck. It was believed that King Edward and his confessors, sorry, his successors, could cure the disease by touching the patient. So yeah, so he has what we are gonna call the sacred power to heal. And again, just, not just people, but he's gonna help heal the country of Scotland. So who, who shows up here but Ross? Remember last we heard from Ross um, when he was talking to Lady Macduff just before the murderers came in. Good God, betimes remove the means that makes us friends. Sir Aidan, stand Scotland where it did. Alas, poor country, almost afraid to know itself. It cannot be called our mother, but our grave. Where nothing, but who knows, nothing is once seen to smile. With sighs and groans and shrieks that rend the air are made, not mocked where violent sorrow seems a modern ecstasy. The good man's nearly stairst asked for who, and good man's lives expire before the flowers in their caps, dying or ere they sicken. A relation too nice and yet too true. What's the news, please? I don't know. Is it okay, so Ross says the country is, it, it's, it's in shambles. It's in complete chaos. People um, are smiling at you, can't trust them. And uh, a common emotion is sorrow, lots of deaths. Um, and we don't know, you know, what's going to happen here. People are just dying. And Macduff says, oh, that is, it, it, it's exactly, you're telling the truth, but it's too true. Like it's real, but too true. So then Malcolm is going to say, what's the newest grief? And Ross is going to say, uh, that of an hour's age doth hiss the speaker each minute, teams a new one. So by this he means anything that happened more than an hour ago is old news. And the person telling it is hissed at because it's so out of date. So things just keep getting worse and worse and worse by the hour. Yeah, worse and worse by the hour. So then Macduff asks, how is my wife? And Ross is going to say, why, she's well, which is equivocation. It's a half truth. She's dead, but nothing can harm her now. So in a way, she is well. He's having difficulty telling Macduff the truth. He will tell Macduff the truth a little bit later, but he's, he is having, having some difficulty. Tage doth hiss the speaker. Each minute seems a new one. How does my wife? Well, well, and all my children... Well, too. The tyrant has not battered at their peace. No, they were well at peace, and I did leave them. Okay, so again, this is dramatic irony. The audience is in on a on a on a secret. Uh, they are all at peace. They're dead. Nothing can harm them. So he's he's just telling a half truth here, but it's tough for him to 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 tell Macduff the truth. Be not a maggot of your speech, I vote. And I think to transport the tidings which I've heavily borne, there ran a rumor of many worthy fellows that were out, which was, to my belief, witnessed the rather, for that I saw the tyrant's power afoot. All right, so, so Ross has come here with some, some interesting news. He says, okay, look, I'm going to tell you the truth of what's going on. He says, when I left Scotland, there was actually a rumor that many of the people were rebelling against Macbeth like they were up in arms they were going to fight against Macbeth and so he says to Malcolm he says look right now is the time now is the time of help your eye in Scotland would create soldiers <clears throat> make our women fight to doff their dire distresses so he says Malcolm your presence would inspire everyone to get the natural king on the throne and we could really get rid of this tyrant yeah so malcolm's gonna say look yeah we're on it we're on the way there look gracious england has lent us good seward so who is seward here is said to be the most experienced and best soldier in the christian world so he is essentially a legend a legend so we've got a legend on our side and not only that we have ten thousand of the most experienced and best soldiers we're going to kick butt, basically, is what Malcolm says. Um, he says, oh, that's a good answer. I'm so happy about that answer. He said, but I have to tell you some words that are going to not be so good. And Macduff says, well, what are they about? And, and he's going to say, is it, is it a general or is it something specifically? 
And we're also going to say, no, it actually has to do with you specifically. Now is the time of help. Your eye in Scotland would create soldiers. Make our women fight to doff their dire distresses. Take that comfort. We are coming thither. Good England hath lent us grace at seaward in 10,000 men. An older and a better soldier, none that Christendom gives our Would that I could answer this comfort with the like. But I have words that would be howled out in the desert air. The hearing should not latch them. What concern, man? The general cause? Or is it a fee grief due to some single breast? No mind that's honest, but in it shares some woe. For the main part pertains to you alone. It be mine, keep it not from me. Quickly, let me have it. Let not your ears despise my tongue, which shall possess them of the heaviest sound that ever yet they heard. I guess, Alec. Your castle is surprised. Your wife and babe savagely slaughtered. To relate the manner whereon the quarry of these murdered deer to add the death of yourself. Give sorrow words. The grief that does not speak whispers the offer on heart and bids it break. My children too. Wife, children, servants, all that could be found. All right, so Ross lets him have it. He says, look, yeah, now I have some terrible news for you. And Macduff says, oh my God, I, I, I can, I guessed, I can only guess what has happened to my children and my wife. And so Ross says, yes, yeah, they've, they've all been murdered. And Malcolm here says, look, try to hide um, your, um, your face. Try to hide, no, he's trying to hide his face because he cannot speak, yeah. Okay, let's keep going. And I must be from thence. My wife killed you. I have said, be comforted. Let's make us medicines of our events to cure this deadly grief. He has no children. All my believers. Did you say all? Oh, hell, kind of. All right, so Macduff here is going to have a little bit of a breakdown. Um, he, you know, he took off out of Scotland so quickly, he didn't really think it through that maybe his wife and children were in danger. Yeah. Um, let's see what it says here. Malcolm says, let's make medicines. Let's turn this deadly grief into like a medicine that can heal Scotland. So in other words, as one passion drives out another, Malcolm suggests that the best way for Macduff to cure his grief is to take revenge on Macbeth. But then Macduff says, he has no children. It is not clear to whom he refers. Macduff may mean Malcolm. Malcolm doesn't really understand because he has no children. Suggesting that Malcolm cannot understand his grief, or I think more likely, he's talking about Macbeth. Suggesting that the tyrant is unable to murder, ch is able to murder children because he has never experienced paternal love. So yeah, so this is his third great crime. Macbeth has killed his children, his innocent children and wife. Macduff may also mean that as Macbeth has no children, he cannot take appropriate revenge. So let's keep going here. Um, yeah, a little bit later, we're going to see Macduff feels really guilty and responsible. Macduff, seeing himself as sinful and worthless, believes that it was his own wickedness that caused heaven not to intervene and prevent the slaughter. Yeah. What? All my pretty chickens in their dam. At one fell swoop. Dispute it like a man. I shall do so. But I must also feel it as a man. Okay, so here we have a big difference between Macduff and Macbeth. So you're going to be asked to compare and contrast these two. We see that Macduff is a real man. He is going to feel his emotions like a real man. And he is going to mourn his children and allow himself some time to feel this. Macbeth, on the other hand, has lost all connection to feeling. He is actually a um, emotionless and unfeeling monster at this time. So we see one man is very feeling. 
feels his emotions and that makes him a man. The other one has no emotions, Macbeth, and is actually now a monster. I cannot but remember. Such things were that were most precious to me. He loved them. Did heaven look on and would not take their part? Sinful Macduff, they were all struck for thee. Not that I am, not for their own demerits, but for mine fell sober on their souls. Heaven rest them now. Be this the whetstone of your sword. Convert grief to anger, blood that the heart enrages. Gentle heavens, cut short all intermission. Front to front brings all this fiend of Scotland and myself. Within my sword's length set him. If he escape, heaven forgive him too. What? All right, so Macduff says finally. All right, I guess I could sit here and cry, but that's not helping things. He says, I could brag about how I'm going to get revenge, but that's not going to really help either. He says, um... What I need you to do, um, oh heavens, is bring Macbeth front to front. Bring him face to face with me. Bring this fiend of Scotland face to face with me. And I will set my sword to him. So in other words, again, Macduff here announces, I am going to kill Macbeth. I'm going to get revenge for what he's done to me, for what he's done to my family, for what he's done to my country. I am his nemesis. Yeah. So Malcolm is going to say, you are indeed a real man. Now this again is contrasting what Lady Macbeth suggested about Macbeth, right? You will be a good, you will be a true man if you follow through with your promise to kill the king. So these are two different definitions of what a real man is. Yeah. In this suggestion, it, it's it's saying Macduff is actually the true man, and Macbeth is not. So Malcolm says, okay, let's go to the king. We're ready to invade. Um, Macbeth is ripe for shaking. The time is perfect. Fruit is ripe and ready to fall. Yeah. The forces of good are armed and ready to assist. Now, this last line here is important. Um, so all of the good powers, the powers above, put on their instruments, put on all of their garb and their um, protective gear. Receive what cheer you may. So he's saying to Macduff, um, hang, hang on tight to the, this one positive, that the night is long that never finds the day. So in other words, let's take a look here. The symbol of good, which is dawn or light, will soon break to displace the night, the symbol of evil. So we have light and dark symbolism here, uh, saying that evil or night is about to get dispersed by goodness, by the light. So of course, the light is being represented here by the true natural king, Malcolm, and the dark is being represented by um, Macbeth. All right, so we're going to end off there. Please make sure that you finish your study guide. Again, I'm going to post the, the quiz that goes along with Act 4 uh, tomorrow. And just make sure that you um, have answered everything and have quotes for support in preparation for that quiz. The quiz will be due at the latest by next Monday at 11 o'clock. All right, peace out. Uh, this